This is the On All Cylinders podcast. Powered by Summit Racing. Your hosts for today are Summit Racing's Al Noe and Brian Nutter. With special guest, professional race car driver and instructor, Aaron Quine. Here we go. Today we are joined by the infamous Aaron Quine. Aaron has driven an amazing variety of race cars over the years and even today you do some really awesome stuff so Aaron tell us about yourself sure so uh, I grew up in uh, Stowe which is not too far from here my dad uh, started racing Corvettes back in the days and uh, an old 66 Corvette and that's when I grew up watching him race and uh, my senior year came and as long as I had the money to run it and pitch in for tires and race fuel and entry fee I got to race it was able to do that with my dad and, uh, and my stepmom as well and we did some autocross and road racing and I just wanted to keep climbing the ladder and trying different things so when you started racing with dad it was always Corvettes and I think your dad was a longtime Corvette club member mm-hmm. and and I think if I remember everything you raced was Corvettes up until the Camaro you have now, right? Yeah, I mean, everything pretty much was Corvettes. I did have a stint in 1995. I went up to Canada and I actually drove the Formula Ford series. I went to the Bridgestone Racing School and ran an open wheel car. And then we competed in a series uh, real quick up there and I actually finished third. The two Canadians won two and I was the third uh, American. So it was a fun little series. But open wheel car is a little different. And uh, I kind of like to stick back to my full cage containment seat and a roof over my head. What's your favorite car that you've ever driven? And you've driven a lot of cars over the years. Man, that's a that's a tough one. I mean, I'm always going to resort back to the Corvettes. That is my favorite car. But, I mean, I've got to drive some Porsche, IMSA-type cars, GT3 Cup, uh, yeah. McLarens, Ferraris. Um, uh, man, the Trans Am cars are a hoot to drive because the Trans Am, the TA2 car reminds me a lot, my Camaro car that I race, reminds me a lot of my dad's old 66 Corvette where you got to drive the car. You know, you got to manhandle right. it. There's there's no ABS. There's no traction control. You got to drive it. Yeah, it's got a lot more power than the old Corvette did, but um, just really fun to drive. You know, one of my favorite pictures of uh, you racing is in your dad's old Corvette of mid-Ohio. <laughs> hanging, the, hanging the tire in a turn, just getting after it. And it was, I don't remember who did it. And somebody took a picture of Aaron at mid-Ohio back in the day in that Corvette and then put a picture of you in the Camaro. The line is like on top of each other. Like the two pictures couldn't be so much more similar. So you are definitely a highly repeatable driver because the mark <laughs> on track was like so on point. I was like, that's impressive. I go in that many years later too. Right? Yeah. Well, we have that. That's in my race shop, hanging up on the wall. And that picture was taken by Tim Obert, who you know, you guys yeah. both know oh, as yeah. well. Uh, Tim shot that one, and um, I blew that up into a picture frame. And then as the years progressed, you know, I still have my C4 Corvette race car mm-hmm. as well. So I have the pictures from 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020, all in the same corner, all blown up in posters. So it's kind of a cool to show all those years progression, of racing right. progression through the years, different cars, but the same turn. So you do, you do a lot of things outside of driving race cars and stuff. Let's talk about Mid-Ohio. Mid-Ohio was just there Tuesday. Um, we had our high-performance driving program, and uh, I've been instructing with the school since probably the late 2000s. Mm. Uh, obviously, I grew up in diapers there, but um, so it's it's my second home. But, uh, yeah, we just did a high-performance school, so we, uh, we have our teen school as well there. But, um, yeah, if you want to be a race car driver for a day, two, or three days, right. you can come down and see us. So what other instruction you do? I know you're, you're I can't keep track of you. You are yeah, all over the, I'm all over the, the country map. doing all kinds of things. So I teach the Ford Racing School as well. Um, I started there in 2014. It started in, well, it started in Salt Lake City. And then we just moved recently a couple of years ago down to Charlotte. So we run at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Right. We use the Roval course, the same course that the NASCAR guys okay. do. And, and we have a great program as, as well there too. A uh, good group of instructors. Um, you can go down there again, be a, be a race car driver for a day. Or, you know, if you bought like the new GT500 uh, with that car, you get the right. package and come down and you get to beat on our cars for the day. Nice. Um, so, and then you can come back and do many different programs that we have. But, uh, yeah, it's a great school to be at, and um, it gets me out of uh, out of Ohio in the colder weather. I can go down there in the winter and instruct. So, hey, you've also done one lap, too, right? One lap of America. You know, it's funny. Uh, Brock Yates, uh, uh, senior, uh, I think he's gone now, but yeah. junior, um, I stay in touch with here and there. Uh, but he always says, when are you coming back? And I ran the, the one lap of America in 2001 in that old uh, D&D Corvette tube chassis Grand Sport. Yes. Uh, uh, Dean owned uh, a D&D Corvette before Mongoose bought it. And um, so he built a roadster, no roof, no nothing, just like the old Roger Penske roadster. It was painted orange. And we wow. drove back then in 2001. It was a little harder. It was seven days, right. but it was almost 7,000 miles. 
in a car with no roof. In a car with no roof. Through whatever weather you're going to hit. It was crazy. <laughs> so I packed my, I actually took, we had a little trunk in the back of the Corvette that we made. And we basically just had basic tools, your clothes, and, and really that's it, and my helmet. And a fire suit, and, you know, we would drive to the track, and then we'd right. take the stuff out of the trunk and get my helmet on. Well, we were driving somewhere, I think through Kansas or something, and it started pouring. So we pull up under the under the freeway under this bridge embankment, and I had my dad's Vietnam poncho, the big green poncho. No I way. put this thing on, and then I put the hood up, put the helmet on over top of it, <laughs> continue driving. <laughs> and I just kind of slouch down in the seat a little bit because all we had was just a little windscreen. Yeah. So I kind of slide down on the seat a little bit so a little bit of the rain would bounce up off <laughs> It's, documented, it's actually documented in Car and Driver magazine because they were covering the to, the story back right, then. Right, right. And um, wow. but we ended up breaking three quarters away through. I think the transmission gave out at Watkins Glen, but we still finished in first in Vintage American. I think we were 18th overall out of 100 cars. Wow. So then 2002 came, and um, a buddy of mine, Mike Miller, mm -hmm. built a coupe car. And it was a 434 cubic inch small block. Yeah. It was a serious, and he, he built this car and he says, I want you to win this thing. Right. So he, he put me in the driver's seat and we went back in 2002 and we duped it out with my good friend, Brian Smith, who's actually my boss at the Ford Racing School. Oh, wow. He was an old uh, test driver for Michelin and did a lot of stuff with the Dodge Viper. Well, he drove the factory back Dodge Viper and me and him duped it out one and two back and forth, track to track. We'd have two races, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. I'd get him in the morning, he'd get me in the afternoon. What was he driving, Aaron? What was he? he was driving the Viper. It's kind of like an ACR, I guess it would be back in the day. And, and you're in the Grand one. Sport. And I'm in an old school Grand Sport, wow. you know, wheeling it. And um, but we went back and forth. And in the end, uh, he got me. He was first overall, but I was second overall in that old Corvette. That's awesome. And, uh, that we true. rocked it. But yeah, that year, I think it was the same deal. It was seven days, almost 7,000 miles. And you didn't get the luxury of sleeping in the hotels like they do now. I think they only do like 32 to 3,300 miles nowadays. Yeah. And they pretty much give you time. I only. You know, it's yeah. only from like here yeah. to LA you know, and back half. And, right. Yeah. And uh, I think they give you time. You know, nowadays you can go to the hotel and get a good night's sleep and a shower where we didn't have that. We literally drove all night long, bonsai to get to the track. We'd pull up to the gate before they even opened the gate in the morning and you just shut the car off and fall asleep. That's right, all sure you got. Yeah, we did your runs and packed it up and move off again. So let's talk a little bit of One Lap America. Because I've been told, and I've never done One Lap, but Brian and I've talked about it. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, that's a bucket list thing. At some point, I'll do. But I've been told, whoever you do it with, you got to be really good friends when you start. Yes, hopefully you'll be really good friends when it's done. It's like being in a phone booth with somebody for a week. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Going, you know, <laughs> as fast as you need to to get to track the track. If the car breaks, you got to fix it. Right. But tell tell us what it's like. I mean, that experience, it's got to be cool. Yeah, that's here. your best buddy for seven days, man. I mean, um, you know, like I said, nowadays, at least you get a hotel room. But we just, I mean, I did all the racing at the tracks. Okay. And then the owner, he helped drive in between. So right. um, a lot of the times we, you know, you get to the point where you can only drive two hours. And I was just tired. And I just needed to get over to the, you know, the passenger seat and, and crash. It's a lot different, uh, you know, now than it was back then. A little bit easier. I'd like to actually do it again. I really would. Yeah. And I'd like to do it in something more modern. I mean, we did good back. That was 20 years ago, you know, that we did that. But I would love to try something with, you know, ABS or. Well, I know our good friend Danny Pop is itching to do it again. Oh, at some man. Point. He's, he's, he's getting, any, yeah, <laughs> he's getting back out after, which is awesome to see him at different yes. events this year. So thrilled about that. So maybe at some point we'll have to throw together a one lap. Uh, oh, my gosh. I would love to even team up with Danny. You know, Danny and I basically have a lot of the same backgrounds. We grew up watching our dads, you know, autocross and, and race the old Corvettes. Yeah. Um, but Danny was in the Cincinnati region. Jen and I was here in Akron, so we didn't cross past too much. Uh, but he was—he's the master. He still is, and I just visited him a, a few weeks ago when I was down in Cincinnati. Oh, awesome! Yeah. So tell us about what you're racing now. So what I've got now, I still have my old Camaro, the, the Trans Am car, the TA2 car. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's on its eighth year, so it's mm. kind of tired for pro racing. So mm. um, I haven't been doing any of the TA2 pro stuff, but I do run SCCA club racing. Okay. Um, and it's still great. We still run Nelson Ledges, Mid-Ohio. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I can go run the Glen and, and many different tracks. Um, and then I also teamed up a good friend of mine is uh, Mark Matisse. He's from up in the Putin Bay area. He's got that Porsche 911, 991.2. Mm. Uh, car oh, it's basically yeah, like an nice. extra car uh, it's like a video game it's paddle shift 9000 rpm trash wow. control you dial it up and so mark and i met through some friends and um turned into a tire customer and then he learned that i raced and so we started playing around in the igt series which is mostly porsches there's a couple 
uh, Ferraris and other things in there too. So he asked if I wanted to co-drive with them because they had some hour and a half long Enduros. Right. Wow. So very nice of him to ask me. So I'm like, man, I've never driven a Porsche before. I don't even know what to do. You know, and he goes, ah, it's like a video game. You know, just <laughs> jump it up and paddle shift and dial in the trash control however you like it. And I remember I went to Daytona. And uh, we went down in December, and IGT was the was the opening uh, race for they do that Audi event every year down at the okay. in December, oh, yeah. and so we were the race series for them. So I got in and I ran I ran my race. I started seventh first time in the car, and I ended up winning. It was a little bit of a rain, wow. and so I wasn't sure how to work the trash control dials and stuff. So I just started playing with them because I noticed you know and, and it started drying out, and I I couldn't get off the corner. I'm mm. like, what is going on with this car? Well, the trash control was dialed to 10. Okay. So I'm like, turn it down, moron. So I started <laughs> turning it down, and I'm like, getting off the corners more. And then I start reeling in cars. Mm-hmm. And then it's drying more. I keep turning all the way down, so it's drying out. And then I just picked them off one by one, and I went on the win at Daytona. That's awesome. So that was really cool in, in the car. But that was a neat one. We did 183 mile an hour through driving the Porsche. Wow. Years ago, I remember you were racing at Mid-Ohio, and you had a very famous race car driver that you were doing some lead follow stuff with. Mm-hmm. Tell us about how oh that was, meeting, meeting that gentleman and what that was like. Yeah, great story. 2018, we were running SCCA Trans Am okay. at Mid-Ohio, and we were also the opening act for the NASCAR Xfinity Series. Okay. So Bill Elliott had seen the TA2 cars, mm-hmm. and he's like, man, that's cool. And Bill, even though he was retired from NASCAR, he's still very much involved in road racing. Bill has some old, like a 70 Mach 1 Mustang. That's a pretty potent car, you know, set up for road racing. And so he saw our cars and he goes, I want to try that. And so ECC, who's uh, good friends of mine out of Chicago, they they sponsor my car too and help a lot of things. Um, They hooked him up with him and said, hey, Bill, you can drive one of our spare cars. And it was a Camaro car just like mine. And he says, well, one problem. I have not been to mid-Ohio since the late 80s when he ran the um if you remember the iraq challenge yeah. series oh, right yeah. so it was like 87 or 88 he goes you know i flew in i teamed up with bobby ray hall alan sir jr and many others and he goes but i, I haven't been back since that late you know late 80s right. so he goes i don't remember mid ohio and he goes, well lucky for you we're going to team you up with a guy named aaron quine who grew up in diapers here he's an instructor he's got a gazillion laps and he's going to be your teammate and your coach And so they called me and I'm like, are you serious? (laughs) And, um, so him and Chase, actually Chase flew in and um, was kind of standing by too. And we hung out with them and um, we did some practice days and, and Bill was up to speed immediately. Just picked it up. Yeah. And at the time that was, that was 2018. And I think Bill was 62. Right. Wow. In 18. So, and man, that guy could still wheel a car. So we went out on the track and he goes, you're going out first. I'm going to follow you lead follow. So then I tell the, uh, the camera guy was there and I'm like, dude, get this on film. I mean, get this documented. I got to have this picture picture of me leading Bill Elliott. Yeah. And so he did. He actually went out and got all the pictures of us, you know, talking in the pits, download session. You know, we were viewing dad on the laptop. I was looking at his in-car cam after we came in on right. the track, you know, and kind of critiquing him a little bit. I'm like, oh my God, I'm standing here critiquing Bill Elliott. Yeah. You know, show him his way around <laughs> Mid Ohio. But he was he was super nice guy and um, a good event. We actually I out qualified him, I think, by like two tenths of a second. Mm-hmm. And then so we were I forget what seventh and eighth or whatever during the race to start and then had some good racing uh, going on. And I want to say about midway through he broke an axle and had the pull off, but uh, he came in after and he says, that was really fun. And, you know, thank me for my help. And meanwhile, that photographer that was taking those pictures, um, I said, any chance you could, you know, get the picture to me and I'll run to like a Walmart and get it printed like an eight by 10. Cause I'd like to get him to sign this picture of me, you know, him following me around the track. And so the photographer actually went and did it, you know, took it, took the picture that he shot of us went to a walmart quick one hour deal printed the picture brought it back to me and bill's like any you know is anything i can you know do for you and i'm like yeah sign this picture that's you awesome know? so i have that framed and in my race shot that, that was mean, pretty cool i want to be him when i grow up great you know? yeah that is so cool <laughs> and chase what was funny is that that weekend 2018 chase was on his way they they got done and they actually jumped on their plane um they actually bill bill uh, flies his own plane by the way okay wow. and so they landed at a little regional airport not far from from mid ohio and then they had uh, got picked up but they had to dart right after the race because they were flying out to Watkins Glen for Chase to run the NASCAR road race. There. Okay. And wow. Chase won that weekend at, at Dude, Watkins Glen. That's yeah. Cool. That was pretty cool. It was his first road race. But that's awesome. Yeah. So if you had anybody else like you taking Richard Petty around or anything like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know what the one one thing, another cool story 
back to 2014 was my first Trans Am race at Mid Ohio, and I actually drove for David Jans. And David Jans was part owner of the Trans Am series, and actually still is a little bit. And he had a Mustang TA2 car. Okay. And so this was before I built my Camaro, and um, my buddy was crew chief in form. And so he he built this car, did a couple races, put some other guys in it, but was kind of stepping back and wanted to concentrate on the on the Trans Am series. So my buddy goes, man. Why don't you put my buddy Aaron Klein in the car? He's never done a pro race before. You know, he wow. grew up at Middle Ohio. He's got a gazillion laps here. Trust me, you know, he'll do he'll do decent, you know. So he hooks me up with this guy. I go, I fly up to Chicago, we go out to dinner and we go go-karting at K1 speed and oh, cool. you know, get to know each other. And he goes, All right. He says, You come up and pick my car up, you take it back home, you wow. decal it how you want to, decorate it, wrap the car, whatever. And wow. um, so he sponsored me for seven races. Mm. So we got the car, we had to work on it. You know, mm-hmm. and we had to drum up sponsorship money to operate it. Mm-hmm. And I was very blessed to to get that help from different people. And um, the first race, we went to Mid-Ohio, and I'm sweating bullets. And Tommy Kendall was still racing no. the series at the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So Tommy wow. was probably one of my biggest road race idols and, and cars growing up. And um, so we qualify. And I think I qualified like seventh as, as there as well out of 38 cars back wow. in 2014. Wow. Big fields, right? And Tommy qualifies right behind me. I think I got him by a couple thousands or something. <laughs> so we go to grid at Mid Ohio and we're pulling up in, and Tommy's slime green Dodge is already there. And I was driving a grabber, grabber orange uh, Mustang. Yep. And so I pull up into my open slot in front of him, you know, before the pre race festivities. Yep. And, and so I get out of the car and I get this tap on the back of my shoulder and I don't know if you know Tommy Tommy Kendall's at six yeah three. right so you know I turn around and I look up and there's Tommy I'm like Tommy you know I'm like oh my gosh so nice to meet you you know I'm shaking his hand and he goes who are you you know <laughs> and I uh, says oh yeah I saw Mary Fine this is my first Trans Am race and you know first time in these cars I said but you know I've got a lot of laps here you know right. I grew up here watching my dad and he goes hell of a run kid he says you outqualified me wow. and he says let's have a good race and um, but yeah. I told him I says like I sat up in the keyhole as a kid watching when he ran the old IMSA GTU yeah. and GTP cars. Oh, yeah. It sounded like a jet airplane going down the back straightaway when you leave the keyhole. And he goes, <laughs> really? No kidding. I'm like, dude, you were my idol. I said, we watched you. And I says, and now I get to race with you. So we went out and this was filmed live right. uh, on TV back then. And uh, we duked it out for like 25 to 30 minutes on television. Wow. And they're like, he was just Aaron Klein guy. He's up to sixth place or whatever, and moving up to fifth. And Tommy Kendall and are duking it out back and forth. And um, and then my crew chief was on the radio saying, "Don't screw up now. You're on every jumbotron on the track. You're on my TV, and the commentators wow. are talking about wow. you about how you grew up here. You know, your dad raced here." And he says, "You're getting some really good press right now." Wow. So we just it was great. I, I raced Tommy Kendall any day, but we went back and forth, front and back, and and he ended up breaking too and had to pull off. And I finished. I was up the third and a couple laps uh, we got a full course caution with a few laps to go and on the restart i got punted off the track oh, and i'm like oh. no because i wanted on the podium so bad my first you know pro race. Yeah. and i'm like come on bro. man adam andretti was in p1 oh. and i forget who was p2 but i'm like man i can stand on the podium with andretti my first Dude. race and i got punted and i went back to like ninth and then i climbed back up to fifth Okay. In two wow. laps, I was on a rage. So <laughs> I got back up to fifth. So that was my first pro race was, was P5 out of like 38 cars. Dude, that's amazing. Man. But yeah, I got the race with the legend Tommy Kendall. And he's such a great guy, class act. And um, little did I know, but down the road, Tommy was still doing contract work for Dodge. And um, at the time, I was still working for Kumo doing tire testing mm-hmm. and different things, if you remember. Oh, yeah. And so my job was to give feedback on the Viper ACR that Kumo developed the tire for. Oh, yeah. So so I was the test driver on the Kumo Those side. Tommy Kendall was the test driver on the Dodge side. So they wanted Whoa. two different opinions of the tires. Okay. And we went to, my job was to go all over the racetracks around the United States and thrash the crap out of the Viper ACR. That's right. a rough job. Yeah, tough <laughs> job. And they'd give you like eight different compounds of tires and you'd have to try and narrow it down to the best tire. And then mm-hmm. Tommy, we hopefully we would agree on the same compound. Mm. But it was just kind of fight where I just got the race with them. Now I got to work with them for a whole week. That's, that's you know, now was that the tire that became the 720? That was the 720. Dude, that the thing is a legend. Oh, yeah, that tire. It, it was outlawed by outlawed. Outlawed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> People built cars around that tire because yeah, right. it's only available in a handful of sizes. Right. Viper, it's the Viper tire. Yeah. And it's so funny because all these people 
did, I shouldn't say all these people, but several people built cars around that tire, and then SCCA went, no, that thing is really, really <laughs> obscenely good. They're like, that's got to go away. And since it's only available in two sizes, it's right. definitely uh, not exactly the a same fair level competitive playing field. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Optum outlawed it. I, think, <laughs> I don't remember if Good Dad's outlawed it, but I think everybody was like, that, that, that Viper tire. Right? Yeah, it was, a, it was an awesome tire. And, you know, that Viper was like a 355, 319 yeah. in the back and, um, you know, on a real small sidewalk in the front. But it was limited sizes, but it was supposed to be a 180 compound, mm -hmm. but it was probably like a 50 compound. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was a good tire. And then they obviously, yeah, so they had to make some changes, obviously. And then, and then they made it available in more sizes. But I think they've got something else out now. that's like a V730, I think. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah. yeah. A lot of people actually pay you to actually set up their cars, and and you have to set it up for them, not necessarily for you. I mean, sure. tell us about that experience and like when somebody comes to you with a brand new car, and, and how does that process work? Well, some of the stuff. I mean, we'll help members out. We don't do too much setup. We do mostly our own things. Um, but I have a good friend, uh, Lance Mallet. You guys probably know sure. Mallet. Oh, so yeah. Lance does all the setup on, on my car, all of my cars, the old Corvettes, the Camaro. He'll do the corner balance and everything. But um, that is so important. I didn't know that growing up. When me and my dad raced in that back in the day, we just drove the car, right? Mm -hmm. If it pushed like a pig, you dealt with it. Right. You know, we weren't really into making those adjustments. And then it wasn't until later on I really learned, like, hey, you know, try a different sway bar, you know, try different spring rates, you know, do a different tire pressure, add some camber, take out some camber. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we started going quicker and, you finally and get the car the handling yeah. better. And then I worked at Kumo doing all the tire development. And, you know, I went to 24 hour Le Mans, France, and I learned so much, wow. you know, by their doing tire data and temperatures on the tires that I could take that back to my own racing mm -hmm. and educate myself. And, and we really started getting the car dialed in. Even working on your C8, you know, just thinking about how, what that car started off with and, you know, how you've developed yourself you know, developed the car, figured out the tire needed on the front of it to get the balance right. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I've had that car to Cincinnati three times with three different alignments and scalings on it. And the C8 from the factory is a great car, but it understeers and it understeers for a good reason. That keeps people safe mm, yes. when you're going fast on a road course, on a cross, whatever. Well, I like stuff more neutral, as neutral as you can get it with the engine now being behind you and all the weight balance shifted around. But it, it's it is amazing when you get, when you get to a point with a car and you say okay it's good but I want it to get better a little bit of camber little change in tow just very small things can make a dramatic bit of difference mm -hmm. and you mentioned tires you having the background you have in tire testing mm -hmm. the two hundred treadwear tire wars mm -hmm. and it's it's fun because on Facebook and in a bunch of the different SCC autocross groups and everything everybody's got an opinion on what's the best tire. You know, what is the best 200 treadwear tire? What's flavor of the day? Is it the Rival, the Yokohama, RT660? You know, now we've got some other new players out. But what's your experience? What are you seeing in that? Are you seeing the, the crazy tire wars continuing? And yeah, same thing. You know, you see the guys with those three, four sets of wheels, and one guy's going to run the Rivals on long, be, you know, or something on our Michelins, or they, they got whatever's quick that they, well, these aren't hooking up to. Let me try this set. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're all over the map. I don't know. I guess I just stick with my, my one tire. I mean, I grew up you know, Hoosiers and, and Goodyear's, you know, yeah, Goodyear's yeah. Right here in Akron. Goodyear probably, uh, we did a lot of stuff with Goodyear back in the day, but um, but Hoosiers are great tire. They're made right here in the USA. But, oh, yeah. um, you know, and that's a different, you know, I didn't do too much street tire stuff though, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, up. you've always been a race. Even race when we all across growing up on the old, on the Corvette, we ran a, you know, a bias ply 15 inch street TD tire. Right. That's wow. what you ran. We didn't run, you know, a 200 treadwear tire. So I've been on race tires my whole life. So with driving the bias play stuff there, what developments have you seen in those tires particularly? Because I've got a friend who runs a, a Shelby Mustang and SVRA that we've known each other our whole life. And we did a track day at Pitt years ago when he brought his 65 SVRA Shelby up. And I'm running around an old red and he's running around in that. And I couldn't believe he was fast on those yeah. bias plies. But... It's fast, but sketchy, I guess is the yes, best way to is. put it. Sketchy and dirty, you know, that yeah. old bias fly tires rolling over on the side, right. you know, and, and you get, but that's what I grew up on. And then when I ran, when I went to a radial, you know, that stiffer sidewall, it changed everything, right. you know, not only did, we, did it change the tire, but we had to change the car too. You know, your spring rates and everything changed when you go from, from a bias fly to a radial or vice versa. That but, was painful for the cup guys and some of the guys that could, were really, really fast on a bias and it took them a couple of years right. actually to come around to a radial. Yeah. And I was excited. Actually speaking, they still had when we ran Trans Am, when Trans Am started in the TA2 series, they were running a 15 by 10 bias fly tire. 
And I thought, wow, great. I've used this one. I'm going to be dialed right in. Right. And so we did run it for the first couple of years. But, um, you know, they did. They changed, the you know, to a mm-hmm. 15 by 10 radial tire, just basically like the NASCAR guys. Yes. Yeah. And and we ran that. And um, But, yeah, it's, it's a learning curve. But we went, I think it was like one and a half, almost two seconds a lap quicker going from a bias supply tire to a radial. Wow. That's it. I mean, that was the only change. So you've changed the tire, changed some spring rates, and it was that much quicker. So tell me about, you know, you've been driving these old Corvettes for all your life, and then you start getting some modern, modern cars with aero and all that mm-hmm. stuff. What was that experience like when the first time you had stick that you never had before? Yeah. And having to go back and forth between those cars now. Exactly. Yeah, good point there. You know, old school Muncie four-speed car, you know, you're, you know, you're heel and toe down shifting, and then you go to the Porsche 991.2 car. And you're left foot braking the whole time. And so you're just sitting there like that. And it's just, boop, 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 you know, right, and, right. and when you turn, the car turns. Right. I mean, you move the steering wheel that little bit, it, it darts in. <laughs> you know, where you turn the old steering wheel, the old 66 Corvette, you turn, then it turns. <laughs> right, right. I was watching the thing on the new GT3 RS, and that thing just looks amazing. Neat cars. And I have never driven in my life, you know, a rear engine car or anything like that. So, um, it, I started out very respectfully. It wasn't my car, big dollar car. And I just crept gradually, you know, getting the pace up. And then uh, then you just get into a groove. But it's a hoot to drive. Um, but I still like to jump back in the old school cars and throw them around, too. So let's talk about Nelson Ledges. That's another, oh, you man. know, you've yeah. got a couple of home tracks. Yeah. Nelson's, you've, uh, you've wheeled around Nelson's a couple of times. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we're right in the center. I mean, we were either, you know, 55 minutes of Nelson Ledges or 55 minutes of Mid-Ohio growing up. I mean, obviously, those were the two top ones. And my dad would travel all other places like Roebling Road and Savannah. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I mean, Nelson's in Mid-Ohio, man. I grew up in diapers there. And it's one of the most historic racetracks i think it's one of the highest average speed tracks because it's a fast yeah. course. average speed it's the fastest two mile course in the united states wow two mile That's long amazing. and just to give you an idea there's there's faster cars of mine but in ta2 uh in my car i just set the track record there in may and uh, i averaged 112 mile an hour Damn. average average what kind of time so wow. i ran a 105.920 for the track record in gt2 seca okay wow yeah, but wow. just to give you an idea, that Formula Atlantic car, which is like a miniature Indy car, he broke the track record for his class at 58 seconds. Right. That's Insane. amazing. Insane. Wow. So a lot of people don't realize how rich history Nelson's is. Um, you know, it goes back to, um, uh, oh, there's some greats that raced there. You even had Tom Cruise did his racing back in the day. If you guys wow. looked that up, he did a, I think it was the red, white, and blue Datsuns. The Datsun 280Z, yeah. Really? yeah, if you guys look no it up kidding. online, you'll see um, a video of him racing. He teamed up with Paul Newman. Yeah. Paul Newman did some racing back in the day. I knew Paul Newman, did, Paul but Newman I never ran the Tom Datsun. Percent. Yeah, look it up. Tom did some racing for a short stint. and um, But, yeah, track's awesome. I mean, I grew up there watching my dad, and I used to critique him. You know, I'd watch my dad, you know, come through the kink, and he'd come in off the track. and be like, Dad, man, I think you can go a little faster through the kink. And he'd look at me and go, you think you're so good, you wait till it's your turn and you try it. <laughs> so <laughs> right. so I, I got, you know, to 18 years old and, and I worked my way up and worked on the car. And that was the deal with my dad. He loved you to death, but old school, man. Yeah, man. You yeah. had to work for it, right? Yeah, that's right. And so I saved my money, man. I was mowing lawns around the neighborhood, painting houses, you name it. I did it because I wanted to have that money ready to go racing. Right. And so my first time I got to go out and race my dad's old 66 at Nelson's, wow. I went out. And I beat the track record in his class that he'd been trying to beat forever. And I pull in off the track and he's standing there like this. <laughs> and I take my helmet off and I go, what? And he goes, find a new car to drive. <laughs> Jokingly, you know, and I go, what are you talking about? He goes, you just broke the track record I've been trying no to beat. Kidding. So my, that was just kind of a funny story with my dad That's my cool. first time on track. Aaron, what's your <laughs> most memorable story about being at Mid-Ohio? I got to say, I mean, that Tommy Kendall one I talked about in 2014 was pretty cool, but the top of the list goes to 2019 when I got a call four days uh, before the NASCAR Xfinity oh, race yeah. and that. said, hey, there's a team, Mike Harmon, out of the Mooresville, North Carolina. It's a smaller budget team, and um, something happened with their driver that was supposed to race at Mid-Ohio, couldn't make it four days out, and um, would you be interested in driving? And I okay. said, man, I, I would love to, but I, I can't bring much to the table. You know, sometimes certain teams you have to bring, you know, yeah. some money in or sponsorships in. And, and I go, man, I, I don't know if I can pull it off four days out. And so we made some calls. I made a post up on Facebook and, and friends, you guys. Yeah. It's just crazy what happened in four days. 
we were able to do my first NASCAR Xfinity race. And uh, actually, I got I actually owe it to Josh Balicki. Josh Balicki actually runs NASCAR almost full time right now. And so Mike Harmon uh, uh, was asking around, hey, anybody know anybody good you know, road course guys right. for the NASCAR? And, and my buddy Josh threw my name out and said, man, Aaron grew up there in diapers. He's got more laps around there than all the NASCAR drivers combined. Right. But, you know, uh, you know, he might not have some funding to help out. So um, he called me and um, we worked it. We made it. And I got to do our first NASCAR Xfinity race. And we I mean, no practice, no nothing. And we got in this big old boat of thirty five hundred pounds compared to my to my car, car, which is twenty eight hundred <laughs> and about five hundred horse, maybe a little bit more. And then you get in the Xfinity car. It was what eight hundred, a little over eight hundred. Right. Thirty five hundred pounds. And so we, we went out and I got one practice session and, and then we went right to qualifying. And I think there was 30, 36 or 37 cars that year. And I qualified 31st and I said, that's all right. You know, it's a long race. we got three hours to work right. at it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they had nothing working in this car. You know, it was, it was cool. I didn't even care. I had no cool shirt. You know, all the other drivers, you know, get the cool shirt. <laughs> oh my they have the helmet blowers. I have nothing. I mean, this car was our race. Yeah, it was basically like a Bristol roundy round car. It wasn't even set up for mid Ohio, but I didn't care. I didn't care, man. I'm getting to run NASCAR. I'm in there. I'm in there. And so this, they got this big old seat because Mike Harmon's got a bigger guy, you know? And so the seat was kind of made for him. I'm like, man, you guys got any padding? And I'm like, anything, grab a towel. And so I'm in this car cinched down, but the the seat is so big and I'm still moving around. So they're wedging stuff down and anything (laughs) you can grab, they're wedging in. <laughs> but uh yeah we ran the race and um i was actually up to 20th i believe halfway through the race and you know they do the segments there was like three segments and we had just gotten through sec- segment two and i was up to 20th and they're like oh my gosh you're, you know you're doing great in yeah. this car mm-hmm. and um we had a restart and um we were up in the keyhole and justin Algaier got punted by somebody and it was one of those deals i was in the wrong spot the wrong time right. and i couldn't swerve left and i couldn't swerve right to avoid the accident and i got caught up in it and um so it ended up we didn't know at the time but we got the hood damaged a little bit in the fender and it cut a tire but i limped it back to pit under yellow and um a national television they're banging the hood out i'm like hey I'm getting TV time. Well, you know, <laughs> the great part of that, Aaron, from a selfish sponsor standpoint, well, yeah. we had Summit Racing on the hood of that Absolutely. car. Absolutely. So we are on national television. Yes. Even though the hood's folded up, our logo was bright and clear. Our graphics group did an awesome job of coming up yes. with the, the scheme we had on the car. But I remember watching that and people texting me going, look at all the airtime we're getting. And I'm like, it's not bad. I go, you know, that old saying, no P- yeah. there's no bad PR. Right. Uh, in case, or even though you had that little right. mishap. Yeah. It was good to be Yeah, it's sure. not how yeah. I wanted to get you, but we got it for nah, you. But it's a cool story, too, where it's somebody local, and you're a great mm-hmm. driver, and you had the opportunity, and a bunch of people came together and huh. helped you make it happen, and you made it happen, it's which just, is the big deal. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, I just thought, you know, we were going to be there racing anyways in the Trans Am Series with the Camaro. Right. And um, I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool to do double duty and run the Xfinity? And it happened. And to even go back furthermore on this, you know, my dad and I, we used to love watching NASCAR, but we mostly watched the road Racing. So when yeah, they ran Sonoma, right. Watkins yes, Glen, yes. that's what we watched together. My dad used to always say when he was alive, he goes, man, if NASCAR ever came to Mid-Ohio and you could get a shot to drive, I thought, oh my gosh. And then I got a shot to do it. Unfortunately, my dad's been gone now about 10 years, but yeah. didn't get to see it. But, uh, he was watching over me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely is. Aaron, can't thank you enough yeah, thanks, for uh, joining Appreciate us today. Appreciate it. Getting it's to always great to yeah. see you, man. Sure. Great to see you guys. This has been the On All Cylinders podcast. Powered by Summit Racing. Check out new episodes coming soon at onallcylinders.com. Onallcylinders.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.